episode three of our Cops Coaches chat. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, episode two was with James Guy and Andrew Guy, his father. Uh, you can catch that on our YouTube channel. Uh, the link will be above us on the screen now. Um, today we've got a couple of stars of British swimming. We have both the brothers, Joe and Max Litchfield. Um, thank you very much for joining us, gents. It's a okay. pleasure to have you with us. Guys, it would be really nice at the start if um, you could just take this opportunity to introduce yourselves and kind of give us a brief explanation of your backgrounds in swimming. Cool. Um, so I'm Max Litchfield, um, Joe's older brother. And um, so yes, I've been swimming all my life, really, as long as I can remember. Um, I started properly swimming uh, Doncaster Darts about what, 16, 17 years ago now um, and kind of moved on from there um, from Doncaster to Sheffield and then 2018 I moved from Sheffield to Loughborough um, where I'm now training as well so um, yeah there are three three main clubs I've been at really in my in my time in swimming. I'm Joe Litchfield, Max younger brother, 21. Uh, I've been swimming long as I can remember. Uh, like Max I was at Doncaster from probably around the age of 10, 9, uh, moved to Sheffield in 2016 for a couple of years. Our 2018 moved to Loughborough and then I feel like for a few months for Commonwealth and then officially stayed after the Commonwealth Games and I've been there ever since. Um, so also you've both, um, you've both had quite a similar journey in terms of your pathway through, through your club uh, life. Um, could you explain who has been your most influential investors in your journey um, and maybe why? Yeah, well, I think there's more, there's more than one. Um, there's definitely like, so from, from a really young age, um, it was Andy Wallace. So um, he was my first main coach at Doncaster. I had a couple before him, um, but he was the first one where I was in like the top squads um, and we really worked well together. So like he was, he was a big, motivator of mine in terms of every day would would be working together on everything really and he was like the foundation of what again it's the same with Joe really the foundations of what we both do now um of course my mum and dad they were massive in it um neither of us would be here now if if not for them the early mornings and late nights and ferrying us to and from training and competitions and stuff all around the country like literally it would be impossible without them um, and for them to kind of, they, they always wanted us to be happy. It was never like, you're doing this. It was always, um, they were just supportive of us and just made sure that we were happy and we were enjoying our swimming. And that's really, really important at a young age. Um, well, it's important, full stop. But at a young age, it's, it's even more important that you are enjoying the sport that you're in um, and that you're getting something out of it. And um, so, yeah, so I think, like I say, Andy, my mom, mom and dad, and then... Um, I guess over the years, it's been just the coaches I've been working with. So Russ, when we were in Sheffield, um, and then now Dave Hemmings and well, Andy Wallace again, to some extent, he's kind of our um, assistant coach there. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of influential people. It's, it'd take a while for me to name all of them, but I guess they're the main ones really that have been there um, throughout the whole process. And see, obviously with Andy and now, and then e even with Russ, he's still there. If, if I ever need anyone to, to come to for advice or anything, he's still available and um, there to help if, if I need it. It's good that you've got that relationship still with Ross and Andy. As age groupers, gents, um, you both stood out, age group and youth, you both stood out for the quality of your stroke and your stroke efficiencies. You're very efficient technical swimmers. Um, what do you think you did in training um, in your practice that, that helped you achieve this? Well, for me, so obviously underwater works probably one of my best features, and that probably all goes down to Dave Cuthbert, predominantly obviously Andy as well. But when I was younger in the age group squad of Doncaster, I was with Dave for probably two or three years. We'd always get sort of like do this underwater work, or else you'll have to do a tuna fly. Do this, or you'll have press ups. It's kind of like things that he has obviously said to us to do or else you yeah, got a punishment because of it. And I really think obviously doing that to an extent for me helped me do it because I was kind of forcing myself to do the underwater, forcing myself to push 
past 10 metres, push past the flags on every single turn of every single session. So I was doing that from the majority of my swimming from the age of probably 10 to 14. So that when it comes to like the age of 14 and now, it's just natural and I'll never lose it. I don't think, obviously now I don't do it off every turn, but when it comes to the main sets, I do it off every turn without even thinking. I'll always have my feet past the flags. I'll always do my last turn on the sets, the last rep, or even the first wall of every single rep. I'll usually go to 15 metres of the water because it's just natural. It's like it feels right to do it at the start of every rep because I'm going to do it at the start of every race. I'm going to do it at the end of every race. So it's kind of like just really embedded Practicing. in my memory and it's just normal now. If I, if I push off the wall on a max, max effort 50, I'd say, or a heart rate set, I would, and I come straight up, I'd swim probably a two seconds slower. Like it gives me that boost and then makes me swim even faster. Cool. And I'm yeah. just interested, Joe, you know, um, <clears throat> you, you said that your coach initially uh, gave you the insight of that and then um, it, it was just your own drive from there on in. How, lo how long do you think your coach had to instigate saying 10 metres off the turn from that point to the point where every day it was just you, it was internally driven by you, your decision? Uh, it's probably until I sort of really started to understand that I had a chance in the sport. So it's kind of like from the age of 10 to 14, at the time I hated it because if I did, it would it hurt. But now you look at it and you think it was amazing. But it was very set on, like, if you don't do it, you, you get in, you get in the tournament fly, you get in the press-ups. Like, all that fear, but sort of in a good way of wanting to do it. And then sort of, as I got older, I kind of knew I was I could do it because obviously you get stronger, your lungs get stronger, and I sort of got used to being able to do it well. And then probably around the age of, I don't know, my, my first national medal when I was 15 or sort of when I was really starting to catch the fastest in my age, I'd probably then think, okay, this is like really something I need to like use. And I'd probably then, from then on, I'd have, I would have had Andy as my coach then. He wasn't as ever, because obviously I was older and I was good at the water. It was kind of like, it wasn't always do it. It was kind of like, do it when you know you need to do it. I think, I think with that, it's, like, it's just, it is just practice. It's the same as any other skill or technique or, you know, Joe practiced every day, even if he was forced to do it at first, um, those, those like world-class skills. And then, like he says now, it's, it's just natural. Um, you don't have to think about it. And that's when you know, when it's autonomous, that's when you know it's, it's really ingrained in there. And then essentially you can focus on something else that's important because that's, that's within your capabilities without thinking. It's like a 10,000 rep rule or something. Is it 10,000 rep? I think. I guess it's similar with that to some extent. Um, you know, 10,000 push-offs and perfect underwater efforts. Maybe that's the... the the, the goal number as, as such. Um, I mean, it's not going to be bang on that or anything with any of those things, but it is just repetition and practice. And then, you know, it becomes way, way easier once, once you get through that phase. Uh, Joe, you, you kind of intimated that when you were, when you first national medal, you, you uh, at that point realized, you know, I know when to use this and I, I know I've got to use this every day. Ma Max, was it similar for you or was it just more ingrained or was it just how how did it grow for you in terms of knowing when to use that skill? Kind of, kind of similar, um, but I think so. Joe's faster than underwater now, um, and he's probably always been faster as as we've progressed the same age. If that makes sense. Um, so Joe's always used it way more as a weapon than I probably was able to. Um, his last turns and stuff are always you know he's, you know whether it's a four a.m. a two a.m. two three, that last turn is going to come up and he's going to take a chunk out of whoever's next to him. <clears throat> One thing that worked well for us at Doncaster was we were in a 20 meter pool, um, four lane 20 meter pool. We were essentially forced into doing underwaters because if you weren't, you were just getting drowned on top of the water because it was 40, 50 people in a 20 meter pool. Um, so you had to make the most of what you could underwater to be as fast as you could. So that, that really, really helped. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess kind of honing it as a skill that I would use in a race. Again, it was just practice. Even now, that's evolved. So I, I was two or three years ago um, on a four med. I'd probably do fifteen off the off the first flat off the start, and then probably um, eight kicks off the first wall. And the two backstrokes would be about twelve meters. The breaststrokes would probably about twelve, and then the freestyle maybe seven or eight. Um, 
and then there was a point where I really started struggling with breath and I was like, I was really get my lungs were hurting at the end and obviously they're going to hurt, but I was really, really struggling for breath. And it was Europeans 2018. And, and Dave said to me, you know, what? let's just try and just do less. Let's just do a, a kick or two kicks less off every wall, make the most of those turns, but you're going to come up earlier um, and you're not going to be panting for air when you, when you break the, break the surface. Um, didn't PB in that race, but it was a race that I swam really, really close to my PB after a, a really bad injury that, that year previous. So um, even now experimenting with those things after I thought I'd nailed on what, I, what my tactics were, um, even then changing things up um, helped me in that situation. So um, I think even if you have got that plan fixed, it, it's kind of having that mindset to know that maybe you need to be a little bit flexible at times um, cool. to change that up. And, and that, that worked for me on that occasion, um, which I thought was really interesting. Well, it's great insight and seeing the way you've adapted that you know, over time. That's quality. Gents, you're feeling unique in, in uh, uh, you've gone from being successful age group swimmers, a successful uh, youth swimmers at national level, uh, both junior international um, accolades and, and both convert to senior athletes. What qualities would you say make um, make you achieve that over the people that get stuck at European juniors or get stuck at national final level? What qualities do you think you guys have over those that, that, that kind of get stuck along the way? It sounds cliche and simple, but it is hard work, dedication, motivation. All these words we get thrown around all the time, um, but it, it genuinely is. Um, if you're talented and you don't work hard, you're not going to make it. If you work hard and you're not talented, to some extent, you're probably not going to make it. It's harsh, but um, it, it, is, it is a fact um, sometimes. So, um, yeah, it, it's, the, it's those cliche words. Um, but, you know, for me and Joe, we, we pushed each other on, which helped um, along the way. And it is waking up and it's, it's waking up early and, and knowing what you need to do is to go out go out to this session and, and give it your all, even though it's 5am and you're, you're absolutely knackered and you've got school for the rest of the week. And, you know, it's, it's about putting in those hard miles and literally almost killing yourself when it is the hardest. Um, Cause that's when it makes the most, most difference when you're the, when you like beaten down and you're, the, you're, you're most tired. Um, it's those sessions when it's, when it's really, really hard to dig in that when you do dig in, it makes the biggest difference. Um, yeah, I say it is cliche, but I guess that's the difference. Um, I think with it as well, like, give it time with some people. Like, you, there's not going to be many swimmers. There are a few, obviously, like, who've gone straight from junior or even gone into senior teams before they've made junior teams or, like, but they're the very few. Like, I kind of did it like I was European junior 2016, so I'm well. And I had World Unis 17, 19, but I went there on my own accord I asked to go and they said you can go and I swam well but it wasn't a, it's a senior meet but it's not anything like worlds like the times you go to medal would barely make a semi barely make anything in world so I'm not saying it's a bad event obviously if you have the chance to go to that I'm saying go but I'd say this last year I've really only started to really get into the senior ranks in Britain and really start to get in those top four top five spots and last year when I got a medal in 100 back, 200 IM at champs, like that's the first two champs, first, oh, third, my second and third champs medal, first on those both events. But like, sort of giving it time, like you might think, oh, I'll go, you're meant to go from junior and you just get a senior team. But if you swim well at junior, British swimming are going to, they're going to, they're going to watch you. Like they're not just going to forget about you. If you just keep going from stride to stride as a senior athlete, do the right thing, then two or three years after you've been a junior, if you're a late developer, then you're going to get into those senior levels. And the people that don't give it that time are going to be the ones that quit, going to be the ones yeah. that leave. Absolutely. We we were actually, uh, myself and Pete were in a um, uh, Zoom uh, like, uh, webinar yesterday with uh, uh, your coach, Dave Hammings, and Mel Marshall from a National Centre. And um, I, I can't even remember where, where the stat came from, but uh, one of the coaches threw out a stat um, five years is the average time to convert from a junior international to senior international now. And that's, when you think about that, you know, the number of people that after one, two years are going from junior to senior uh, kind of quit, it, it, it makes a 
big difference kind of knowing that that stat yeah. and ultimately joe it kind of says that you're still on the early doors of that ladder aren't you you know um so look at the best like pete pete was just a junior summer he wasn't anything like he went to european juniors but he didn't win any medals he didn't i don't think no he didn't do anything exceptional and now he's the fastest man in the world by over a second and world record holder broke his world record countless times on both events and yeah like he developed as a senior athlete better than he did as a junior but it was later on in his career and yeah. look where he is now absolutely absolutely Jen, you probably alluded to some of the qualities already. Um, who's the who's the best athlete you've ever trained with? I think for me, <clears throat> so we had when was it twenty? I think it was twenty fifteen. Um, Kasuke Hagino came over to the UK, okay. um, and he trained. So me and Lewis Coleman went down to Bath. Well, it was actually Millfield because Bath was getting redone. Um, so it's me, Coleman, uh, Kasuke, and then like Jimmy. And a few others, Pav was there, and um, Roberto Pavoni. And honestly, that week was just insane. Like, I was, that's what, so I was been at Sheffield two years at this point. So I was kind of, that was year of world. So I'd made commies, that was it. Commies and Europeans had done at a senior level. Um, so, like, Hagino was like my idol. Like, he was the guy that had just won the bronze in, in 2012. And I was like, this is, this is insane. Like, this guy's unreal. Um, and I went in there and it was, it was just, literally session after session after session, he would just absolutely destroy us. Um, like I pride myself on being quite a good trainer and he just came in there and absolutely just tore us apart. Um, we'll be doing like threshold sets, like 200s long course and he'd, he'd just be repping out like 158s and stuff. And honestly, it was, it was just incredible to see, like just session after session, rep after rep, he just kept going. Um, and it was only like a week or so of, of training, but still it was, it was just incredible to see. And, Again, it was those those qualities of you know coming back and just even if you are tired, just going again and um, to see that was just was pretty incredible. Did you get any advice off him whilst you were training with him? Not directly, just off me watching really. Um, but like he, he he he's such a nice guy as well. Like he's not he's not like he's he's big headed or anything like that. He's just he's a, just a normal guy, um, and you don't see that when you see people on TV and stuff and, um, you know, just meeting him and realizing that, you know, he is just a normal, normal dude. And he's just, um, he's just incredible at what he does. Um, it was pretty cool to see. Um, and yeah, like everything, like even like pre pool and stuff, a lot of what they do in Japan is very different to what we do. Um, not a lot of strength stuff, but like he'd get there like half an hour before like we would, and he would just, some of the stretches and stuff he was doing were incredible in terms of flexibility. And um, that's why the Japanese are some of the best, technical swimmers in the world um i think just because of the way it's ingrained into them at a young age so um yeah that's probably the the, the best person i've trained with i'd say their, their mobility program's immense isn't it yeah. and just just on that obviously you said he he battered you all week did you come away from that demoralized or did you come away going oh i'll go race my game not yeah not really like in certain sessions i was like jesus like how how am i going to beat this guy like it's just it's not going to happen um, but then like after it, I'm like, well, at the end of the day, he's, he's got better because he's done this every day. Um, and you know, for me, it was like, well, this guy's a normal dude. He's just trained really, really hard. Um, why can't I do the same? Um, and you know, I went, went on and I raced him. I'd not raced him at that point ever really. And then 2016, obviously I went and raced him in, in Rio and he won the, won the gold in the four med. Um, and then the year after was the first time I did beat him in, in a World Championships 2017. Um, and like, yeah, I think, I think it did motivate me. It was just one of those where it was probably subconscious. Like I wasn't like, right, I've seen this, I'm going to go now. Because that was always my drive. It was always my passion. But like, it was probably just a switch to say, right, like this, this guy's just a normal guy. So why not me as well? Did, cool. um, did you ever have a similar experience when you were growing up? Like maybe training with one of your peers? who could have possibly been working harder or doing something different, bringing some other attribute to the table that you thought, yeah. actually, I could do that. I, I need to take that on. I, th I think, like, at Doncaster, we're all... Me and, yeah, me and Joe's selves being together was competitive. But the people around us that we were racing against at the same ages as was, was the same. You know, Joe had people like Jarvis, Parkinson. Um, I had people like... Um, 
Elliot at the time and, and Nick Granger and stuff that have come through the ranks. And then, you know, just day to day being able to race those guys was so important for us. I think it just ingrained that competitive nature that we have anyway, but just made it even, even, even better. Um, <clears throat> When I was kind of 15, 16 ish, I wasn't really the fastest in the squad. Um, and I was never, I was like fourth to go sub minute in my little training group on 103. Um, everyone beat me pretty much that I was friends with, that the little group we were in. Um, and I was like, well, that doesn't matter. Like at that age, it's, you know, it's, it's obviously not nice at the time. But I was like, if I just keep working hard and um, I'm doing everything I can, then I'm going to eventually overtake those people. Um, I guess it's someone thought Joseph before, it's like, if you are getting, beaten by your friends or you're not quite as fast as them at a young age it's not doesn't mean give up um you've always got to keep trying and keep believing in yourself that you know that you can do that and I think you say that that back and forth nature between me and Joe and the friends around us was really important at that time as well Brilliant. Joe how about you I think like training next to like with Duncan and all the guys when we go on altitude is always a really good experience of like having the whole GB team there all the most of the GB team there are not like sort of challenging each other. I think like when we went to Altitude, we had me, Max, Mark, Dino and Duncan, who five of probably all go sub two, the five fastest in the country, three or four of which have made international semi-finals at least on that, on that event. Uh, so it's like groups like that really help you and really help you motivate yourself. But I'd say, I'd probably still say Max is the best, best trainer I've trained with. Like, there's levels that he takes himself to that I don't, and I can admit that. I do at times, but like the you ask anyone who we train with, like Max is probably the most motivated swimmer you'll train with, and he'll just push himself to kill himself basically. Like there's been sets where he's gotten out and he can't be able to breathe. He, you hear him on kick sets at the end of like the last few. I don't know if it's just the way he is, but he'll come in grunting and moaning like as he's kicking because he's pushing his body to that like much pain. It's bad. And he's got, <laughs> cramp. he's got like his vinegar sachet things he has that cramps up. And I'd probably still say there's not many people in the world that train harder than him. I'm not saying that to get to a high level, you have to train like Max. Because people don't. There's people, it's bad saying people, there's people who have beaten Max don't train as hard as him, I'm sure. Like, it's just obviously the, at the higher level you push yourself to, you're probably going to get more out of it. But I'd probably still say Max is the best. But then again, with the Japanese, I went to a Japanese camp and they're probably the, the, the best group I've trained with you know, like as a junior swimmer. I went, on, I went on a camp with the, about 40 of their swimmers and they just do 300 fly pulls like it's nothing. And I was there. I'm pretty sure I had a shoulder injury that week. I was just in agony. Nathan was Nathan Hilton, who took us, was just saying, she just got a man up. Like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't look weak when you come out or else you don't invite us again. But I got through it and... Yeah, it wasn't fun, but you, it? it helped you. It helps you realise that the stuff we do is not as bad as that. <laughs> is it? Is it true they did two K swim downs and stuff like that? It's like every session was the same. So you, it'd be we got it reason. I my medley group got it reasonably like in the middle. Like we probably averaged seven, seven and a half K. All right. Uh, but then like Kyle, that's, it, that's in the middle, right? Kyle was doing, <laughs> Kyle was doing eight, nine K a session. Like Luke Davies in the breaststroke group, they were doing. 9Ks, 8Ks, like, but it's every session you come in to be a 2K warm up, you do a bit of pull, a bit of kick, and then a main set. But like, the amount would change. Like, if it wasn't a kick dominant session, they'd just do okay, you got 200 kick, and they'd do it in some form of effort. Then you'd have a big pull block, probably about a K, probably involving some kind of fly pull with paddles. And then you'd have a main set, or if they wanted to do a more pull set, they'd do kick, bit of pull, bit of swim but they'd always follow that order and then you do a swim down and it stacked up to be some insane volume every session. And at some point you probably do a bit of hard kick, bit of hard pull, bit of hard swim. Like it just, and you probably be doing close to four or five K effort during the session. It was ridiculous. Obviously we've been talking a lot about your journey and um, uh, how you progress through your journey. Um, one of our in questions at the moment in the coaching team is um, what your non-negotiables are. So when, when you're in training and competition, what are the non-negotiables that you, you won't accept anything less than? There's a lot really, I guess. Um, I know one for me, like we, we go on about a lot at Loughborough now, um, is like pre-pull. But for me, like it's so important for me, it's important for everyone, but the, the injuries I've had in the last, <clears throat> sorry, the last couple of years, 
um, if I go into a session now without doing pre-pull, um, I'm going to get injured pretty much. Um, or at least in that session, I'm going to get out and I'm going to be sore for the next couple of days in my shoulder or my hip. Um, it's just one of them things now where I, I just can't afford to, to miss that stuff before and the activation, um, making sure that I'm, I'm fully warmed up in those, those sore and, and vulnerable areas. Um, and just making sure that I'm ready to swim really. And it is, it is boring stuff and it is, you know, it's not that fun to do, but for me now it's something that is is huge and um i think if i'd been more on that as a kid um and kind of done more more for it when i was the age whooper then i probably might not be in this situation now if that makes sense um, obviously we don't know if that's that's true or not but um there's the potential that if i was more on it back then that um that now i would be in a, in a better situation um other non-negotiables um I mean, I guess for me, it's just make it's just giving your best all the time. <clears throat> it sounds dead easy, um, but there's not a session I come into. It's not it's not about being going max every session, as Joe just said. It's not just going crazy. It's about if you've got a technical session, it's about being focused and on it, and you know you're a hundred percent focused on being technically good. Um, if you've got a VO2 session, it's about coming in there and giving it your best effort for the whole session. Um, and don't get down when things don't go your way because it's a matter of life that things won't go your way sometimes. Um, and that's especially the case in sport where you've got ups and downs. There's no one that's, no one that's come through um, swimming or any sport for that matter at an international elite level that hasn't had those ups and downs. And if they tell you they haven't had an up and down, then they're lying um, because it happens. It's just, it is literally a matter of, of life. Even, great Michael Phelps has had those ups and downs um, in some way or another. Um, I'd say it's different for everyone in terms of that scope and what, what is an up and a down. But um, yeah, I guess, I guess for me, those, those two stand out is, is the, the preparation stuff around the pool um, is so important. And then just giving it your, your a hundred percent effort or focus um, in every session. Yeah. Being there in the moment for sure. For sure on that. How about you, Joe? I think same same things that Max has just said, but then like more specific to competition, like priming, like I never used to do it. And it's definitely the biggest thing at the moment, I'd say with uh, with the staff we have at Loughborough and Bath. And they're really like looking into like what are the best ways to prime, whether it's like doing something in the morning before you go to the pool, doing something at the pool, how intense you go. And sort of like doing, they've been doing heat guns, they've been doing uh, jump testing at competitions we've been at in the last year. Really looking into like how and who like does well under that priming pressure. And I think I do like doing the priming and then be, like being a bit tired and then taking that sort of heat and that energy into the race. And that's for me now is probably a non negotiable, like just making sure I'm always doing that at the bigger events because. Uh, that's what I need. Like I took a medicine ball to World Unis last year, carried it in my case because I knew I wanted a medicine ball to do before my race because I knew no one was going to take it. And then everyone in the everyone in the team ended up doing that. So just little things like that. Like if you know there's not going to be something available, like we didn't have a SNC coach going with us, so I knew no one was going to take any sort of medicine balls or bands. So I took it upon myself to go. Okay, I'm going to take a four kilogram medicine ball and find room for it. I'm going to take some bands and other people brought some other bands and everyone sort of came together and sort of had a little bundle of your med ball with some bands and we could all sort of actually get through a prime routine and we all sound better because of it. But well, I guess the word that encompasses all that is preparation really, isn't it? It's like Absolutely. being prepared for the unprepared as well. Um, and obviously we are normally um, really lucky in that we have the whole team behind us and that's, that's supporting us along the way. Um but in those situations where you don't have necessarily have that full scope of, of people to there to help you, it's, it's about being prepared and, you know, making sure you've got everything planned out before you go to a meet or a, a camp or something. Um, I'm the worst for doing stuff like that and going to camps and overpacking because I just pack everything just to make sure I've got everything of what I need. Um, so yeah, preparation again is a really good one. Yeah. I, I, I can't, we can't reiterate that enough, you know, um, and that that little phrase you just used, being prepared for the for what you don't know, like packing a med ball and the bands. Um, was there anybody else on the team that did that, Joe? Uh, no. So obviously, I 
Abby was there and a few other Loughborough guys and I said I was going to take it and they were like, okay, I'll use it. But I don't think anyone else was going to bring a med ball. So it's kind of like I held everyone out and like all the guys from other teams in the country went, we're using it. Like, so it kind of, it made the squad, help the whole squad, the whole squad but you know, it's kind of just something I thought I want. So I'm going to take it. It's good. Good. Pull, pull the standards up as well, didn't it? Across the board by the sounds of it. What's your brother's biggest weakness? <laughs> I don't know, probably with Max, probably obviously his biggest strength is how hard he trains, but that probably could also be his weakness. Like he pushes himself to where limits of his probably his muscles and I don't know if it's the same now, but I don't know, he's probably pushing himself into that pain too much at times. And that's when he can he's been injured in a few little areas, which probably is just because he pushes himself to that higher limit, which Again, it's a great strength, but knowing those limits, and obviously he's getting better and knowing the limits. Like, remember, at, uh, remember at Chef, like the amount of training we did was insanely high, and that's probably what, in with Max then pushing himself to that ridiculous limit every session, probably injured his shoulder at the time, or was part of that, and just sort of knowing them limits, and he's getting better at it, obviously, but knowing those limits is probably what. Uh, guessing you need to work on would you say what, what um, was it what was it max was it the was it 110 or 115 100s infamous 120, set 120 120 <laughs> all the energy joey's joey's right there there and you know a lot of my um like process goals over the last couple of years has been about training smart i know everyone throws that around recently and you know, training philosophies and everything are changing from training hard to training smart. And that doesn't mean you don't train hard. Um, but this year and last year, both my process goals have been to get through a season uninjured <clears throat> or at least to have no little niggles across, along the along the season. Um, this year was a great example of it. And I was doing perfect until, um, until March. And then I had a little niggle just before everything got cancelled. Um, so we managed to get to March, which is better than, you know, November or something. But that's still got to be the main focus. If I can stay fit and healthy in the water for the whole year and not miss any sessions for any reason, then that's going to be the biggest, the biggest thing for me. Because um, that's what's hindered me over the last, say, the last few years. It's just that I've always had to, there would have been something that's kept me out of the water for a week or so. Um, you know, it doesn't sound like a, a great amount over a full, full three cycles, but it makes a big difference. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is just hit the nail on the head that really in terms of what is a strength, but it's also a weakness at the same time, I think. Max, would you say, um, if you said you were picking up a niggle kind of just before this all happened, would you say that actually this probably this isolation and shutdown period might have actually been a bit of a benefit for you? <clears throat> yeah, I think, well, when it first obviously got announced that um, – well, it was first that trials was cancelled or postponed at first, wasn't it? So, um, you know, at this point we had probably five weeks till trials. Um, and I was like, okay, cool. That's probably not the worst thing for me. It's, you know, it's, it gives me a little bit more time to make sure my hips, at this point, my hip was improving already. Um, and it was just a, a case that I didn't have to rush back into things as much as I would if we had five weeks. So at that point, it was obviously a, a really good thing um, and really helped me in terms of getting my head around getting back into the water and getting back to, to race fitness. Um, and then um, obviously the whole, all the news came with postponement and then cancel, canceling and then obviously Olympics got cancelled. So at first it was a good thing. And then obviously at that point when things started getting cancelled, it just became the same as everyone else really. Um, but at that point it definitely did help me get my head around it a bit more um, just because I was, I did have that little bit of time to, to help me get back. How um how were you both kind of coping with the period, um, and has 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 anything that you've done in the past or any kind of struggles that you've suffered in the past um had, has that helped you during this time? Uh, yeah, it yeah, helps. You just got to think of the positives. Like what's happening, you can't stop it. No one can just you can't just complain every day and say, well, I can't train, so I'm not going to do anything. You've got to think, well, everything's been cancelled, so there's nothing of importance this year now probably not going to be any big summer meets so it's just do what you can to stay fit 
keep your body going. Don't just sit around all day doing nothing. Just think. And it's kind of like a time where you can sort of do something that you've not done before. I, like we are quite lucky. We've got a squat rack and a watt bike, so we can do a lot of our gym work here. And we can do cardio on the bike. So it's kind of like we're in a decent place still as swimmers or as, as athletes, not as swimmers, because we probably won't know how to swim and get like a pool. But uh, just sort of doing what you can and just thinking, okay, this will, this will be all over, hopefully as soon as possible. And when that comes, we're going to have a good probably six months until December when you'd have a short course meet or whatever happens if that goes ahead. And then another four months of trials. So you've got over a year to prepare for the summer meet next year, whether that be Olympics for hopefully us or just for trials in April. But just sort of use it as a positive and really think about something that you can do to make better yourself and not just dwell on what's happening. Yeah, I think, well, yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, really. It's, it's staying positive. Um, but if you ever do feel down and you feel bad about yourself and about the whole situation, that's not, that's not bad. That's, it's okay to feel that way because your lives have changed massively and dramatically since, since before lockdown. So if you are feeling like that at any point, then it's, it's not an issue. Um, reach out to people and family, friends, staff, anyone that that will be there for you to kind of lean on Um, because yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, like Joe said, there is nothing we can do about this. Um, And if there's nothing you can do about it, then there's no point in stressing about it because you're just going to cause more stress by stressing about something you can't change because it's all in the government's hands really. And essentially, well, I guess we can change it in some sense in making sure we do stay home and we stay isolated as much as possible. And that will then bring that time period down. But essentially we we don't have any say in what happens and what the next few months and weeks look like so it is making the most of this time um learning new skills or whatever or just keeping fit as possible and spending time with family and family at home and stuff so um yeah just trying to come out of it with a positive mindset and um you know thinking forward and think about how good it is going to be when you finally get back in a pool <laughs> You guys are doing about you doing about eight Zoom sessions a week, aren't you? Um, as in cardio or S and C sessions a week, aren't you? Roughly yeah. at the moment. Yeah, it's part of that. At first, I think a lot of us weren't too keen on it because we thought, oh, I've got to do it at a set time. We don't really got any flexibility. But I think it's actually made it better. Chat, like talking to people and going on uh, these sort of things and just speak, staying in contact with friends really helps people get through this. Mm. And just like when we have we have our little squad and we're doing like little taskmaster thing this week where we're basically just having to do stupid tasks like we've had to peel a banana with our mouths and nothing but it and just things like that we just like send them in and then we're going to get them all a powerpoint come together and just have a laugh and see and just it'll just lift people's spirits and then we're going to have, long have you got uh, have you got a banana there do you want to show us your <laughs> <laughs> they're all gone but yeah. <laughs> Lots of practice. Like we, we did a funny funny trick shot video and we've been doing things like that just to keep us entertained, but just finding something yeah, really helps. Continuing on the, the theme of challenge, so obviously with the isolation, um, uh, for some it's challenging, um, but it, one of the topics we'd like to discuss are kind of hardships and, and, and challenges um, that you've experienced. Could you give us an example of a, a challenge you've had in the past and how you've managed to deal with it? Um, maybe not even successfully, but how, how you've managed to deal with it? I think from my from my standpoint, I had a really poor Commonwealth Games. And from myself, then I went into that. I came sick, but I came sick out of nine. So I didn't really, and I didn't get a PB. So I didn't really class that as the best I could have done myself. And I didn't swim well in my 200 med. But I was going into it with really high hopes and I thought I was going to swim well. But then obviously I didn't. And then you look, I look back on it now and I didn't prepare my, myself. I wasn't in the best shape like body-wise of my, that I could have been. And I think ever since then, along with now what I've got is more strength and better training at Loughborough. I think with that and like getting my body into a better shape, I've gone into what I think has probably been my best year so far. And I really just, so I think that's how I've got over that challenge, just making sure I'm really focusing on myself and not just going winging it. I've already made commies. I don't need to, and I went there and I just saw a bit average, I'd say. I mean, most most would uh, take the accolade of making, you know, finishing six at Commonwealth as that, you know, a, a, a badge for life that they'd be delighted with. 
did you come away from that and just right i've got to raise my game and i've got to address this uh, i had to raise my game like it was a weird phase in my career because uh there was things going on at sheffield and then we moved to loughborough for four months i'd only been there for four months so i was things were going from my head was do i want to stay at loughborough do i want to move to back to sheffield like so i and i kind of like instantly asked comments i wanted to go back to sheffield but i sort of thought to myself and i was like i, I need to stay and i think it's probably the best decision i've ever made and staying at loughborough now i think i've gone to a level that i wasn't anywhere near i i wouldn't if you had told me i was and I have any chance of making Tokyo two years ago, I'd have said, you're lying. Like, I was nowhere near the best in Britain. My, physically wise, I was nothing like the best. And now I've, I thought I had a chance this year. And then next year, with another year of training, I think I'll have an even better chance. So really just, for me, that sort of coming back from that disappointment at Commonwealth into doing well now has really been a big turn point in my career. It, it clearly shows that you've got a growth mindset though, Joe, because... A number of people that have got to that point, finished sixth, this is my peak, or this didn't happen for this reason, and are giving themselves an excuse to just plateau at that level or gone back to, you know, Sheffield's a great program, uh, you know, superb program. I have a lot of respect for the coaches there. But you chose an opportunity to, to go on uh, that some would say would be risk-taking. Um, and and that's, that's a growth mindset to, to make those decisions. That's, um, I think that's really, really, really positive. You know, Max, how about you, challenge-wise? Yeah, I think, I think, well, just picking up on what Joe said there in terms of the the, the negative, um, and turn that into a positive. The same thing for me, really, was like my biggest turnaround, I should say. Again, was Commonwealth Games, um, twenty fourteen. So, um, this was the first year I've been at Sheffield. Um, I'd made um, juniors obviously the year before when I was at Doncaster. So it was my first senior meet. Um, I went to trials, not really expecting to make the team, but I had high hopes of, of doing that. Um, obviously, I knew at this point, like speaking before about the transition between junior and senior, um, I knew how hard that transition was going to be, which I, I thought was really important. Um, I wasn't going in there thinking, oh, I won gold medals last year at juniors. That's going to be the same this year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win everything. Um, I knew that it was going to be a, a tough transition into that, that, that senior, that senior programme. Um, Went to went to trials and I made managed to make the team team England for for the summer for in Glasgow, um, and at that point my mindset switched and I was like, okay, cool, I can actually go to Commonwealth Games and I'm in a shot in in of a shot with a medal really. Um, if I swim a really good PB, there's there's a, there's a definite chance I can win a medal, um, and this was kind of the point where I think the the thing we talked about before in terms of my weakness and training like crazy hard, potentially kind of first reared its head without me even knowing it. Um, we just uh, that that training period between trials and the summer was just incredible. Like I was just smashing out sessions left, right, and centre. Like I was just just going for it. And then got to come off games and I swam awful. Um, I swam four twenty five. Um, I came nine for something and didn't make the final. Um, this was out of like ten people. I beat like one person. So, um, and I, honestly, I just I didn't understand what what was going on. I didn't really get it. Um, I was in tears. I, I went to Russ and I was like, just don't, like, what, what's happened? I don't understand it. Um, and and for, for, for a couple of weeks, we, we still didn't really know what was going on and why I wasn't swimming fast when I should have been. Um, and then I went to Europeans. Luckily, I'd been selected for Europeans, which was like three weeks after commies. Um, and I went there the first day and I swam terrible on the four and three. I went like 354 or something. At the time, my PB was like 351, I think. Um, and I was just like, I just didn't, I still didn't get it. Um, and I remember Tim Jones was there and I remember him saying to me, you know, we just need to to pull back. Just the rest of the week, Fawn Ryan was last day. Um, it was like, right, just pull back. You've got seven days basically to just chill and do nothing. Um, I remember plodding up and down. I did like a 1500, 2K a day, no intensity, just drills, skills, just feeling the water and staying in the water. Um, I mean, I got to the last day and I went 4.14 and I came fourth in Europe. And that's a nine second drop from where I was at Commies three weeks before. Oh yeah, 11. Good maths, eh? Um, and like, I just didn't, like, I was like, that's insane. Like, I've not done anything there. I haven't gained anything these last four weeks. Um, I've not trained harder or anything. I've trained less and done less. 
and that was just me realizing that I do need that rest. And because I do go crazy in training sometimes, I need that that big rest into a meet to make sure that my body is fully recovered. Um, and that was kind of the point where I, I say I did realize that maybe we do looking back on it is where I did um, firstly pick up on where perhaps I do need to back off a little bit at times. Um, and yeah, that, that was a big, a big turning point for me because I kind of understood my body more. And um, again, it's, it's those things when, when you have a really negative experience, you learn the most from it. Um, if everything's positive and you just PB'd and you've split everything you want to split and, you know, technically off the walls or in the, in, in your stroke cycles, you've, you've done things excellently. You're going to learn a bit, but I think you're going to learn way more if, if you've had a negative experience and then you can reflect on that and see where you've gone wrong and what you can then do better in the future. Brilliant. That's, um, I, I'm interested um, uh, in your current support team. So if, when you're facing challenges in your week, uh, your week to week practice, uh, you're going for a bit of a rough patch. Um, I, I'm kind of guessing that you probably use each other, but who's in your support system and, and why really can't, well, we're in a really good position, obviously, in Loughborough that we have a great team around us. Um, that's not family, friends, that's the staff. Um, you know, we've got everyone you could ever need, really. And I think what's what's been great for me the last couple of years with the, the training smarter thing um, is that that whole team around us has come together. Um, you know, everyone, everyone within that team knows exactly what I'm working on and what um what my 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 goal is what my focuses are week to week day to day um and that that's a, a huge system that's revolving around itself um and everyone's interlinked in that um and that that's what's really helped me i think over the last couple of years in terms of all the injury stuff that's gone on in the last couple of years is um is that team that's just everyone's interlinked and everyone knows what page everyone else is on um so it stops, you know, it stops someone, me going to the gym and just getting told to squat 200k because that's what I need. But I can't do that because of my hip and whatever we've done in the pool. And having that, obviously 200k, I'm never going to squat, by the way. But um, <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> those, 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 those patterns of, of people working and communicating together is so, so important. And, you know, communication is the key word there. It's, it's having that, that, you know, people talking to each other and making sure that you, you're all on the same page. Um, yes, I think that's that's the, the biggest thing in terms of the system of staff around us is very, very important. Brilliant. Is it any different for you, Joe? I think it's kind of the same. Like, you've always got someone there to talk to. Like, if, if you don't want to talk to Dave or Mel about something you've got, there's psychologist now Tom Bates I don't talk to him personally but I know Max does and a lot of other people in British swimming and you can if I wanted to I could approach him and he would probably talk I could talk things through him if I had an issue we have a lifestyle uh, advisor who is a huge help because really he helps with uni like mm. so I was transferring from Halland to do my last year at Loughborough and he just he was he'd only just come to the centre so it was like a all right here's your first job transfer Joe's course to Loughborough so it's kind of like he's come in, he's been throwing this thing and he's like, he just sat me down and like, okay, we need to do this, this and this. He had contacts with the Loughborough guys. He got them, he got me, got a meeting for me with them. I spoke for it and it was really just a pretty, pretty fluent sort of system then because we just knew what we needed to do. We needed to like apply for UCAS and whatnot. And then I got to know him better through that. So if I ever have another issue at uni, I can just talk to him about it. I know the other guys, like I know Archie, does a hard course and he speaks to Josh all the time about like his timetable and how he can adjust that and what he needs to go to, what he needs to prioritize for training, what he can miss. Like, and just having that system and like Dave helps Archie with that and helps everyone. If you need a session off to do an assessment, if you need it off to do a class that you really need to be there for, he's not going to say no. Obviously he might say, okay, I want you to come in and do a bit of training before I want you to do this session another day. Like, but just having that sort of easy communication really helps in the, in the center. That's good. That's good. As um, age group youth swimmers going through Doncaster and um, Sheffield, what kind of support systems did you have then? Cause obviously club setups uh, don't have the affluence that British swimming national centers do. 
Um, who did you go to, you know, in times of challenge in that setup? Um, when I was at Donny, I never really thought about it as much. Obviously, if I had an issue, I'd go to Andy. So it's kind of just like Andy was the SNC coach, obviously, because he did all the sessions like that. He was the coach. And if I ever needed to talk to someone, I'd talk to Andy about it. But I think issues you had now, you don't really have as often when you were younger. Like you sort of just sort of swam when you were younger. And, but now, obviously, there's bigger things of uni. Like, obviously, when you were at school, you just swim, school, swim. Like, we dad never really sort of changed on that pattern, but now with uni, I'd sort of prioritise swimming over uni. In a uh, in respect to obviously, I do my course, but sort of it's a bit different now. And then at Sheffield, we this is just I think it was just a, a lot of coaches. Like there's when we were there, it was Russ, and then there was even there was Dan, and there was Carol, and all the all the helpers that were there, like they really help you get through it. And if you need, if you didn't want to go and talk to Russ about something, you can go and talk to Dan. You can go and talk to another helper and just sort of get through it in that way. But I think I'm guessing it's the same for most clubs that like you don't really have that support, that support staff like the centres do, but talking to the coaches that you have around you really helps. Yeah, well, I was, was going to say, like, I think one thing, like definitely Doncaster and stuff when I was at school still, um, just like my mum and dad, like I think not necessarily directly in those times of um, of struggle, but obviously when we were at GCSEs and then A-levels that were really, really tough um, and probably had more work at A-levels than I do at uni now, or did at uni, should I say, I've um, graduated now. The, um, you know, like <sighs> the, when we were kids, mum and dad would always make sure we were on top of homework and, and stuff like that. And that kind of got ingrained in me and I'd make sure that, you know, every time we had, we'd have Tuesday afternoon off and I'd make sure that was the, the time of the week I'd do all my homework. And any, literally any free periods of the nap, uh, A-levels and stuff, I, would, I wouldn't be wasting them away. I'd make sure I was on, on it and I was doing stuff that I needed to do. Because I knew that at night and any time before school in the morning, I wasn't ever going to have a chance to do, to do that. Um, and then it stopped me, you know, getting in at eight, nine o'clock at night from training and having to do work till, till midnight um, because I had to get it done for the next day. So it was just being on top of that. And obviously people will find their ways of doing that. It's obviously going to be different for everyone. But I think being um, very structured with how I did things um, as a kid and making sure that, um, you know, I was I had my day planned out. Essentially, I knew exactly what I was going to do. Um, Mum and dad were great in terms of picking us up from college and school and everything and making sure that we were going to get to train on time. So we didn't have to stress about that. Um, you know, I think just having that, planned in plan and structure in place from a young age just really helped us through then high school and then then into a levels um so obviously yeah mum and dad were, were huge in that as well I don't, um i've met your dad a number of times uh and seen him on deck um and so for myself i kind of uh, have a good idea what you, what you want to say but for the benefit uh, of our members what kind of influence did your parents have on you guys during your student career it's just like everything in it. Like your parents need to be as invested as you. Like, yeah, I'm not saying that parents aren't, but if you're not fully invested in your kid, you can't expect them to do as well as you want them to. Like you need to make sure you're getting them to training. You need to make sure you're doing what you can to make them a better swimmer. And I'm sure my dad would say it if he was here, like now that we've achieved what we can on the, you know, and to drives everywhere, it's, he, he, they love it like seeing us swim in international level it's like they've achieved that as well as us because they've done just as much as we have because they've had to taxi us around feed us basically just make us sort of who we are as, as a life like they've made the lifestyle that we have now like they sort of like we wouldn't know what to do now if it wasn't for them yeah, we definitely wouldn't be here that's, that's for sure um so they just it is it's it's about sacrifice for the parents as it is much for the kids. Um, you know the amount of times they would sacrifice. You know, going out on a night for a drink or whatever with the friends and stuff because they 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 couldn't because we were training or whatever it is. And like you know Wednesday mornings we would go and train at Sheffield um, every now and again when we're at Doncaster. So we had to get up like four a.m. or something because obviously it's it's a bit longer to get to Sheffield and. We'd just get up, roll out of bed, have some food, and then we'd just sit in the car and sleep. And then 
mum and dad would drive us there. And the way back, we'd do the same, basically, and we'd just sleep in the car while they're all, you know, while they're driving. So it's a lot of sacrifice and, you know, it probably is hard and I'm sure they found it hard at times, but I think, you know, they, they just wanted us to be happy and to succeed. Um, you know, and they could see that, that swimming brought us that. Um, you know, if we, if we, as kids, we ever went to them and said, oh, we don't want to train anymore, um, they weren't going to force us to swim. Um, they just wanted us to be, to be happy and to be successful in what we do, really. How much, if, how much of an input do they have now? Obviously, they don't like, deal with our own matters now. Like, we live by ourselves, we cook by ourselves, like, apart from now, apart from now. Uh, we still are, we still did most of it, but sort of like, they like sort of grew us up to know what we're doing and like now we do it all for ourselves more or less like they obviously still want to know what's going on my dad still knows what's going on in British Swimming he'll look at what's going on with the newsletters and whatnot and we'll tell him what's going on at times where he can know and they're still invested in it and they still don't forget about us but obviously there's not that much need for them like obviously they're not going to come and live with us in Luster and drive us around and like they have their own lives now and they They've, like they've obviously done it all for so many years and they can just now sit back and look at what we're doing and sort of just think, okay, we've helped that. Mm -hmm. And like, it's just, if we ever get medals anyway, it's just as much their medal as it is our medal. Like, yeah. yeah, at the same time, they're still like our biggest supporters. They're always, dad comes to like books and stuff and watches his race and um, he just loves it. So, you know, they, they still obviously come and, and support where they can and, you know, dad'll, mum went to, World Unis last year and dad came out to, to Korea to watch me. So, um, yeah, they'll still try and travel the world and stuff to see us, to see us race as much as possible. Brilliant. Brilliant. Right, we're, we're going to move on, gents. We're going to go and have a little bit of fun, hopefully. Um, we've got uh, some quick fire questions for you. All right, are we ready? Um, when, when did your brother win his first national medal? Yourself? <laughs> 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 um, Right, Joe, what's yours, mate? 09. 2012. We'll see if we can do any better on this next one. Okay, when did your brother win his first international medal? That can be junior. What have we got? 2012. All right, next one. Um, who would you consider to be more of a mummy's boy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any 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 examples or reasons why? Uh, I don't really know. I just feel like I don't know. Oh. Just a bit of a mummy's boy. Both a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mum looks after me better. Okay, um, next. What's your brother's favourite meal? I don't know. I know he loves this. Avocado on toast. Oh, margarita nice. pizza. Margarita. <laughs> <laughs> Max, is your favourite meal avocado on toast? Yeah, Probably my favourite like, breakfast meal. Like, <laughs> toast or like what, Egg Benedict, that sort of thing. Oh, nice. Good. And Joe, margarita pizza? <laughs> Right, um, what's your brother's worst habit? That's fair. <laughs> so, <laughs> Joe says biting yeah. nails for Max, and Max says shouting, shouting on Xbox. Xbox for Joe. Hopefully not contentious one. Who wears the trousers in the brotherly relationship? <laughs> Yeah, oh, 50 oh. 50. <laughs> That's definitely Joe, then, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> How hot do you like your Nando's? Um, oh, what's it called? What's the one? Wait, am I doing Joe's or am I doing mine? Joe's. Joe's. You're doing your brother's, mate. Yeah. Oh, lemon and herb. It's not. Uh, it's not. It's not peri peri. It's the. Uh, it's the, the secret. secret, the secret, 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 secret. Nando's one that Max likes. Right, last last one, gents. 
Who's your brother's celebrity crush? Oh, hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's got a good taste. Oh, you gone for the same. Oh, oh. That's all, gents. That's all. all. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for your time. Uh, really appreciate your time and your effort. Uh, and well, if we get any more this season, best of luck for the rest of the season. Otherwise, best of luck for 2021 uh, season. Thank you very much. I hope to see you around soon, gents. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.